Welcome to Kingdom Fungi Part 2, the Macro Fungi. In this lecture, we're going to start talking about the Basidiomycota. Here's our phylogeny of fungi. We just finished talking about the ascomycetes, um, so we were defining those by the presence of this ascus. So everything in this phylum is going to have that sac-like structure that has the eight ascospores inside, and that could have a variety of different shapes. So now we're going to be looking at the basidiomycota, which are going to be defined by that name as well. The basidiomycota are the mushroom forming fungi. So when you hear that term mushroom, usually that's going to be referring to the fruiting body of a basidiomycete. So they have complex septations. So we saw simple septations when we were looking at the ascomycetes. And so our simple septations we had a cell wall forming to make cells, and then there was just a simple pore through the middle. Here, for our complex septations, they make these weird kind of ballooned outsides, and then they're surrounded by these structures called parenthesomes. So they have a lot of um, stuff going on at this interface between the different hyphal components. So they also have clamp connections. So if we were to see these um, joining parts of two hyphal um, cells here, they would have this little um, bump on the side. And that has to do with the way that they are keeping two different nuclei, that dikaryotic state, in every um, hyphal compartment there. So the spores are produced on basidia. You can see the basidia here. That's a basidium, and it produces four basidiospores externally. So it sort of blobs them out as opposed to the ascus, where the ascospores were produced internally inside that structure. And this last part, they're primarily dikaryotic. So in the ascomycetes, we had two haploid, um, what you might call them, mycelia. And then when those met, they would make a fruiting body right then. But for basidiomycetes, they are going to spend very little time being haploid. They germinate as haploid spores, grow a little bit as a monocaryon. You can see that label here and then must quickly find another monocaryon to fuse with and do plasmogamy, fusion of the cytoplasm, and then they form this dikaryon. And that is almost the entire life of a basidiomycete will be in that dikaryotic state. Okay, here's the fun part. We get to draw a mushroom, and so for our mushroom that we'll draw, it'll be an Ammonita muscaria um, because they have the most fun um, components. So we'll start with the cap, which is also called the pileus. And that cap is going to have little warts all over it. So these are sometimes called warts, um, but they are universal veil fragments or scales. And I'll explain the universal veil in a second. And so this cap sits on top of a stipe that has all sorts of crazy stuff going on. Okay, so what have I just drawn here? So we have our cap, which is the pileus. And on top of that cap, we have our little universal veil fragments. Underneath the cap, if you look on the underside, there are gills on this particular mushroom. And that's where the spores are produced. Spores produced here. You might also hear this called the hymenophore, which would be a more inclusive term. The structure that is like a stem, so a stem type thing, is called the stipe. And it has two things going on with it. The first thing is this ring here, the annulus, and that's from the partial veil. And then at the bottom, you have the vulva. And that's another part of the universal veil. It looks like a W, but it's a U and a V. So the universal veil, when an ammonita is 
just starting to form the mushroom, it forms a little egg. If you were to cut that egg open, you would be able to see the beginning stages of mushroom formation. Um, so it is really like a little mushroom egg. And that egg shell is the universal veil. And as the mushroom grows, it inflates with water and pushes that eggshell open. And then you get these little warts as little pieces of the eggshell stuck to the cap as it expands out. Sometimes it'll be in one big patch. Sometimes it'll be in these nice little dots. It depends on um, the conditions and the type of mushroom. And then the bottom of the eggshell is here, the vulva. So we have the bottom as the vulva and then all of these little warts up here as the, the top of that eggshell. So our spore producing surface doesn't always have to be gills. It can be a vast variety of different um, formations. So up in the top left, you can see the tubes of uh, the beefsteak mushroom, Fistulina hepatica. Each one of those little individual tubes has a bunch of spores and basidia being produced on the inside. Next to that, you see these long dangling spines. So that's heresium. Um, that's one of our lion's mane mushrooms. And on each, the outside of each of those spines is where it would produce its spores. So it's almost like an inverted tube. Down the bottom left, you can see a jelly fungus. Um, those are going to be um, these tiny little orange kind of blobs. And then once they inflate with water, when it rains, they turn into these gelatinous globs. And those are just covered with basidia and spores on the outside. In the middle there on the bottom is a puff ball. And so if you think about, if you took all your spore producing surface and you just jammed it into an enclosed structure and then let it dry out and then once it gets hit with raindrops or ruptures, then those spores just poof out into the air. So a similar strategy, but inverted, is what you see in the very bottom right hand corner right by my face up here. Um, so this is um, Phallus impudicus. Um, it is one of the um, stinkhorn mushrooms. Phallus means penis because they all kind of have a penis shape to them. Um, on the top are the spores. And it's almost like if you took this puffball and you ripped it open and turned it inside out. And it's just this mass of gooey spores. And they stink because they're fly dispersed. So you have these gooey, stinky spores um, that attract flies that then walk around and get the spores all stuck to their feet and then fly away. So here we have um, some of our basidiomycota that are forming lichens. So most of the lichens that you see out in the world are formed um, with an ascomycete, but here are a few weird ones that get formed with a basidiomycete. So on the left there um, is lichen amphalia, and it makes this cute little umbrella-shaped mushroom. And then on the right um, is a lichen that forms with a club fungus. So this is multiclav multiclavula? Yeah, multiclavula. So it makes these little tiny clubs and they're really kind of regularly spaced. The rest of the lichen is this green slime that you see here. That's the algae and some of the um, hyphal filaments all wrapped together, making that green slime. Many basidiomycetes form ectomycorrhizal relationships, just like our ascomycota. Um, so this is when they are uniting with a plant, um, with the plant's roots, and instead of going inside of the plant cells, like our endomycorrhizal glomeromycota, making those arbuscules, the tree-like structures, they go around the plant cells, and this ends up making a net-like structure. And so you can see that net over here in this picture. This is all fungal tissue that was surrounding plant cells, and so this is the Hardig net. And we'll look at that in lab. So the Hardig net forms between and around the cells, and then a really dense mat of fungal tissue forms on the outside of the root, and that is called the mantle. So those are two kind of components of an ectomycorrhizal root tip. Up in the top right corner, you can see Ammonita phylloides. That is um, an ectomycorrhizal fungus related to the one that we drew. Um, and it's the one that's probably responsible for the most deaths um, because it looks similar to a few different edible fungi. Some of the edible fungi that grow here, as well as some that um, are more common to other countries. 
Um, and so it's um, a lot of accidental ingestion of this extremely toxic mushroom. So watch out for that one. Some yeasts and molds are also basidiomycetes. Um, so we can see here, we have two different ones. Cryptococcus neoformans is in the upper right corner. You can see it's forming these little bud scars here from where it's budding out and reproducing. Cryptococcus can cause um, infections in people, but usually only if you're immunocompromised, but it can cause some serious problems like um, encephalitis. On the lower left, you see Malassezia globosa, one that you might be more familiar with. This is one of the most common causes of dandruff. Um, it's a smut, which we'll learn about in a second, that lives um, next to your sebaceous glands, so glands that are secreting oil in your skin. Um, you get a lot of those in your scalp. Keeps your hair nice and beautiful. Um, but the Malassezia like to live around those glands, eat those oils, and then they produce um, metabolic byproducts that some people are allergic to. And so you can get dandruff from that or just dandruff from an overproduction of those um, fungal cells on your head. Okay, the rusts and smuts, two of my favorite groups, particularly the rusts, sorry, smuts. Um, but the rusts and smuts are uh, mostly plant pathogens, but you do have some um, commensals, such as our Malassezia um, and some human pathogens as well. So top right corner, we have a cedar apple, um, which is caused by gymnosporangium, and it makes these long, gooey kind of tendrils of spores on um, juniper and other types of cedars um, or things related. Um, but that one, um, is going to have to, once it makes those spores, they have to move into the soil and then they make another type of spore that has to go infect a different type of plant that makes another type of spore that then can go back onto this um, tree. That's a really complex life cycle. In the lower left, you can see wheat lacoche. So that's caused by a smut called um, Eustilago matis, and it infects the individual corn kernels and makes them inflate to these big, weird, ghostly looking things. Um, that are apparently quite delicious. I tried to look up what it tastes like because I've never had it before, and it just said mushrooms plus corn. Smoky and earthy, um, but it's a delicacy in Mexico. You can find it canned, but I think it's kind of uh, has more, maybe a more slimy texture, whereas if you can get it fresh, then it's supposed to be more velvety. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our phylogeny here. We learned about Basidiomycota and that those are united by this presence of a Basidium. And that Basidium can look really different. Usually it's producing four spores, sometimes it's making two, sometimes it looks like a little, you know, club shape, which is what it's named after. Little alien guy. But sometimes it's like a weird tuning fork or it makes spores off the side, such as in the case with the rusts or smuts. So it can look really different, but the spores are produced on the outside, unlike with the ascus where they're produced on the inside. This has been Basidiomycota.